Hello. In this short presentation, I want to talk about the idea of responsibility for international crimes and how, as lawyers, we connect individuals with what are often mass atrocities or examples of group criminality. So in this course, we tend to use the phrase modes of liability for, des for describing those legal theories that will connect an individual with a crime. Um, and this is important, particularly in the case of crimes committed by leaders. So how do we tie someone? And here we have uh, an image of President Charles Taylor at the Special Court for Sierra Leone. Um, how do we tie leaders sitting remote from um, any area of conflict uh, with the actions of their subordinates, perhaps committed a long way away. So we'll be exploring a number of concepts um, and these, um, these include not just a technical description of the various modes of liability, but we have to grapple with some of the underlying ideas. What is it that international criminal law or criminal law more generally is attempting to achieve here? And one of the fundamental concepts we need to look at is the idea of fair labelling. So David Nasersian describes fair labelling in these terms. Um, the fair labelling principle aims to ensure that the label describing criminal conduct accurately reflects its wrongfulness and its severity. Now, this leads us to a potential problem. In national criminal law, we tend to think of uh, the direct physical perpetrator as the person most responsible for a crime. Um, so in a murder, the person who is most responsible is the murderer, the person who pulled a trigger on a gun killing someone else. An accessory might be involved in that crime. You might aid and abet the murder by giving the murderer the gun. But the aider and abetter is generally seen as less responsible. They are somehow more remote from the crime itself. The difficulty with international crimes is that often those more remote persons would appear to be the most responsible. They are leaders, but they are certainly not the ones pulling the trigger. And this can lead to a sort of sense of contradiction. In an ordinary way, we might think of some of those more remote figures as being more like accessories than perpetrators. But this would seem to understate their responsibility. It would seem to violate the fair labelling principle. And this has led certain academics like um, Gideon Boas and his co-authors to discern in the practice of the tribunals what they described as a growing obsession with labelling defendants as being perpetrators rather than as aiders, abettors, orderers, instigators, or even responsible superiors. So at the heart of this branch of international criminal law, there may be a pressure to, or a demand to, expand the idea of who is directly responsible for a crime, who is a perpetrator, in order to give effect to this idea of fair labelling on the theory that many of these other labels imply that someone is less responsible. So let's start sort of delving down into um, the modes of liability. So the core one, as we've already intimated, is obviously perpetration. So if we look to the language of the International Criminal Court Statute, Article 25.3a refers to a person who commits such a crime, whether as an individual or through another person, regardless of whether that other person is criminally responsible or not. Uh, now this covers a number of cases. So you may individually and directly commit a crime, or you can commit a crime through another person. Now that leads to some questions about uh, how one does such a thing, but um, and what it means if such a person is or is not criminally responsible. The classic national law criminal textbook example of committing a crime through another person who is not criminally responsible might, for example, be uh, pouring a glass of poison wine at a dinner party and giving it to one guest to give 
to another. You know you are attempting to murder the second guest, but the first guest who passes the drink does not. The crime has been committed through them and they are not criminally responsible. Other crimes might be committed through people who cannot be held criminally responsible, for example, because they are children, as in the case in international crimes of child soldiers. So you might be said to commit a crime uh, through child soldiers if you are a commander of a group of child soldiers. But equally, you could be said to be responsible for ordering that crime, or perhaps um, if the crime was committed through a failure of supervision, you might be thought to be criminally responsible as a superior. So there might be multiple ways of describing the one crime and not simply perpetration. Um, the next important idea that we have to cover in international criminal law is mens rea, the mental element of a crime. So not every act that might result uh, in death or injury or another wrong is obviously a crime. What we usually accept is that there must be an accompanying relevant mental state for a crime to be committed. So the International Criminal Court statute requires that unless provided, a person shall be criminally responsible for a crime only if the material elements are committed, so the elements of the offence, with intent and knowledge. So along with the International Criminal Court statute, we will become familiar with the elements of crimes, which spell out the material elements, the actions or consequences that make up a crime, and also the required mental elements. Now, the statute on its face says that what is required is intent and knowledge. Um, now, in practice, what will happen is that the offences will be divided up into various elements, some of which may require intent and other of which may require knowledge. So murder, as a war crime, involves the intent to kill a protected person, for example, a civilian, but with knowledge that you are doing so under the cover or guise of an ongoing armed conflict. So you need knowledge of the conflict. So you will have intent going to one element of the crime, the killing, and knowledge of another material element, that there is a context of armed conflict within which the crime occurred. So under the ICC statute, you'll have intent where you mean to engage in the conduct or where in relation to a consequence, you mean to cause the consequence or aware that it will occur in the ordinary course of events. So for example, that goes to some indirect or oblique forms of intent where if uh, you plant a bomb on an aircraft with the intention of killing one high-ranking official on board, but know that in the ordinary course of events everyone else on the plane will die, you may be taken to have intended the death not only of your target but everyone else on the plane. Um, and knowledge means awareness that a circumstance exists or a consequence will occur in the ordinary course of events. Know and knowingly shall be construed accordingly. So for example, in relation to a war crime, you need knowledge that as a matter of fact, an armed conflict is going on. You don't need uh, to know whether that would be legally classified, for example, as an international or non-international armed conflict, or whether other, other um, legal conditions might be satisfied. You simply need knowledge of the underlying facts of the existence of a conflict. Uh, let's move on. So there are a number of general forms of participation in a crime beyond uh, being the direct physical perpetrator. The obvious one being aiding and abetting, but similar um, concepts uh, arise in international criminal law in terms of instigating an international crime or ordering it, amongst other examples. Now, each of these forms of secondary participation in a crime themselves may have certain material and mental elements. So you'll have not only the direct perpetrator uh, who has committed the relevant offence with intent and knowledge, but you as someone who has participated as, for example, in an aider and abetter, must have done a particular act and must have had a particular mental state. So the general standard before the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia, as in the Forenzija 
trial chamber decision of 1998 was to say that the actus reus of aiding and abetting consists of providing practical assistance, encouragement or moral support, which has a substantial effect on the perpetration of the crime. The mens rea required is the knowledge that these acts assist the commission of the offence. So the idea essentially here is that um, you must have done something that affects the perpetration of the crime and in the ICTY jurisprudence substantial effect perhaps meant nothing more than de minimis. Uh, it didn't necessarily mean um, determinative or critical but it had some effect so it's substance in a fairly uh, minimal sense of that concept and then you must have known that your act assists the commission of the offence. Now what is not necessary on this definition is sharing the same mens rea. So you could aid and abet genocide without having to share the intent, the special intent of genocide, to uh, destroy a group, a protected group in whole or in part. And that gives rise to some controversies because one could then be convicted of genocide through aiding and abetting but without having to prove the special element that is perhaps the core of genocide. And we'll come back to that controversy later in the course. An important form of international responsibility for our purposes is the idea of command responsibility. Now, this um, essentially requires a superior subordinate relationship and that um, uh, that is defined, at least in the ICC statute, the Rome statute as I have it on this slide, to include both military and civilian superiors. Um, but the idea has some subtle differences. A military superior is responsible for the actions of those under their command and control, whereas a civilian superior is responsible for an area within their sort of effective authority and control. Uh, and one way of thinking about this is that a civilian superior has a more closely defined um, domain where they're responsible. So an example I sometimes give is that a Minister of Transport might be responsible for the actions of his subordinates if they use the Ministry's um, logistical support to enable the commission of war crimes or crimes against humanity. That would fall within the Minister's effective authority. A military superior is presumed to generally to have control over a wider range of conduct, but the question will still be, to what extent does the military superior have effective control? So particularly in a civil war situation, someone who might appear to be in the position of commander might have only very limited control over their subordinates. And the first, one of the first principles of command responsibility is that the commander is not required to do the impossible. Then there's the mens rea requirement. A responsible commander must have either known that offences had been committed or were about to be committed, or uh, had information that should have put them, as it were, on notice that further investigation was required. There is a further requirement that you failed to take reasonable measures. Again, you're not required to do the impossible. And under the Rome Statute at least, there must be a causation requirement. Your failure of supervision as a commander must have caused the offence. This is in some ways a little difficult to conceptualise. We don't normally think of a failure to do something as being causative, uh, but it would seem that the best way to think of this is that the failure of supervision appears to have increased the likelihood of crimes being committed. Now, a commander is responsible not only for prevention of crimes, but also punishment of crimes which have already been committed. And this leads to some controversy as to whether a commander should be held uh, responsible for failure to punish crimes committed by their unit or force before they came into office. Now, in a sense, there's no logical problem in saying that someone still has a responsibility to punish conduct that occurred before they took on a role. Um, that would seem logical enough. But generally speaking, uh, the case law and jurisprudence appears to favour the idea that a commander should not bear retrospective responsibility. 
uh, that they should only be responsible for a failure to prevent or punish conduct that occurred, as it were, on their watch. Now, the point about command responsibility is that it is one clear way of tying leaders to the conduct of their subordinates, yet there have been relatively few convictions on the basis of command responsibility, and one of them in um, recent proceedings in the Bemba case was overturned on appeal, in part on a submission that uh, Mr Bemba lacked effective control over his supposed subordinates. So we might think that this special international criminal law doctrine should be used more often. But one reason it might not be a popular charge for prosecutors is the fair labelling principle we discussed before, because command responsibility doesn't suggest directly that you ordered um, or were personally responsible for the commission of crimes. It's a failure of supervision or a dereliction of duty offence. All by its nature, it suggests that um, these offences occurred uh, of their own, that subordinates were out of control and that the commander is only responsible in the sense that they failed to prevent things. So as a form of omission liability, it might be seen as actually, in some senses, um, absolving a commander of direct involvement in crimes themselves, and therefore is misdescribing their level of responsibility for what occurred. This also leads to a question about whether command responsibility is best thought of as um, tying, an offend, tying a commander to the offence, meaning they should be sentenced based on the gravity of the offence itself, or whether it's a separate dereliction of duty offence, in which case punishment should only reflect, as it were, how negligent a commander was. Now again, in practice, it appears that the jurisprudence favours the idea that the commander becomes directly responsible for the crime. Um, but again, as a form of omission liability, uh, that might, at least at a theoretical level, seem quite harsh. Moving on, uh, we then have a sort of have raised a question of how do we tie individuals to crimes committed by groups? Because the nature of international criminal law is that most international crimes are committed somehow in a group context or by groups, and yet we prosecute individuals. So there are questions about how do we connect individuals with group activity. Um, so one doctrine that was said to arise from customary international law and was popular, uh, a popular prosecutorial tool at the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia, pictured here, and also the Tribunal for Rwanda, was joint criminal enterprise, um, a doctrine which certainly has parallels in the common law, although it has recently been, uh, in effect, abolished in the United Kingdom as being incompatible with certain basic principles of justice. In any event, it was said by the appeal chamber in the Tardic case in 1999 at the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia that a joint criminal enterprise required a plurality of persons, so a group. Uh, it required that they have a common plan, and it required that the accused participated in that plan. There were then said to be several uh, different forms of joint criminal enterprise. Uh, as it were, a simple form where everyone is present at the same place at the same time and is all engaged in the one offence. So on this sort of version of joint criminal enterprise, if uh, a group of people are involved in uh, assaulting, for example, a detainee who then dies, it doesn't matter who struck the fatal blow. All might be guilty of the murder. Um, a second type of joint criminal enterprise focused on, as it were, organised systems of cruelty or harsh treatment, the so-called concentration camp cases. But the third or extended form was the most controversial. So the extended form would say, if you participate in a group activity to commit a crime, you may indeed be responsible for further crimes going beyond the plan if one, it was foreseeable that such a crime might be perpetrated by another member of the group, and two, the accused willingly took that risk. So, for example, you might participate in a plan to commit uh, an illegal forced deportation during an armed conflict, rounding civilians up and um, putting them on buses or trains uh, to go to a detention camp. 
and you might know that, so the, the plan might only go, in as far as you've agreed to it, to the forced deportation. But if you know that a number of your co-conspirators uh, have genocidal intent or that their troops are particularly poorly disciplined uh, and likely to shoot and kill a number or indeed perhaps all of those being transported, then under Joint Criminal Enterprise Type 3, you are liable not only for the forced deportation, uh, but also for any subsequent murders or other crimes committed against those detainees, so long as it was foreseeable and you willingly took that risk. Now, um, the doctrine proved controversial in practice because of the difficulty of defining um, the group and the scope of the plan and what constituted a relevant act of participation, and then the large scope of liability for further foreseeable offences. It became a very wide net with the possibility of capturing uh, big fish and small alike in one net or web of criminality. So it was seen as suffering potentially from a degree of vagueness and overexpansiveness. So an alternative um, has been pioneered in the International Criminal Court. And this involves interpretation of the definition of um, the concept of perpetration that we've already seen in the statute, which as you'll remember included acting um, either you know, alone uh, or through others. So the material elements of co-perpetration as outlined in say the Katanga and Lubanga cases involve an agreement or common plan, uh, but then a coordinated essential contribution by each co-perpetrator. So one of the criticisms of joint criminal enterprise was the standard um, of contribution to a plan required was fairly low, perhaps as low or lower even than aiding and abetting. Whereas in order to label someone as a co-perpetrator, someone who has committed a crime as part of a group on the co-perpetration theory, you have to have had some ability to control whether the crime occurred or whether it occurred at a particular time in a particular manner. So the withdrawal of your contribution would fundamentally change what was happening and this could be said to be an essential contribution. So for example, um, if you are a commander um, of an ethnically based um, militia and you're trying to make a coordinated attack on a town, you might need to cooperate with someone else who commands a different militia and each militia will only accept, for example, instructions from someone of its own ethnic group. Under those circumstances, both leaders have control of whether the attack goes ahead or at least whether a coordinated attack using all of these forces happens. Both of them could be said to have an essential contribution tying them together. The mental elements then required are that you intend the resulting crime and you knew of your essential contribution. So as compared with joint criminal enterprise, the theory of co-perpetration at least seems more circumscribed in terms of who will be described as having committed a crime directly through this theory of liability. Uh, now one question that we'll address in a discussion exercise is, do we need such elaborate theories tying, and here we have the defendants um, from uh, the Nazi leadership at the end of the Second World War at the Nuremberg Tribunal. But, you know, do we need such theories of group criminality as joint criminal enterprise or co-perpetration if aiding and abetting or command responsibility will do the job? What is going on here? Is it simply a question of fair labelling and accurate description uh, of the offences? And what difference does it make to whether we describe someone as having committed a crime or simply aided and abetted a crime according to which theory we deploy. So we'll be looking at some of those nuances in a discussion exercise. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope this has been interesting and I look forward to talking about these ideas more with you in class.